Athanan. Okay. So where we left off was talking about all this stuff with how Google does search and the sort of information that they can use to get that search, uh, to get those search results and rank them and all that. So let's move on. Now, today we're going to talk about Google delivering search as a product, right? As something that people want. So typical users, they want to get results fast, right? They want to quickly get good search results. They want the search results to be relevant, right? They want it to be more or less what they're looking for. And they don't want to have to think too hard to do it. So they want to kind of type in some words that more or less describes what they want. And hopefully Google can serve up some relevant pages for that. Okay. So ideally, you'd have some kind of user friendly interface, right? Google just had a text box. It's hard to mess that up. Uh, you'd like an immediate response. Google's pretty good with that. Typically delivers search results in about half a second. And last, want the results to be relevant, right? Want them to be very good as far as stuff that the user wants to see. And among different search engines, relevance is actually the strongest differentiating factor, right? Reason is, what happens, what happens if, suppose it's 1997 and you've been using, you haven't heard of Google yet, so you're using uh, Lycos.net, which was a popular search engine back in the time. And suppose you type in a search query and the results you get are pretty garbage. So what do you do besides going and looking for Google, right? You don't know of other search engines at this time. So what do you have to do? You get some search results and you're like, oh, that doesn't sound right. What do you do? Yeah. Revise your query. That's one option, right? But that's time out of your life that you're not getting back. What else might you do? You look at the search results you get and you're like, hmm, I don't know. All right, there's like nothing in the top five. Yeah. Yeah, you'd probably take that time, wouldn't you? You'd like scroll through them all, hit the second page, hit the third page, hit the fourth page, and finally you're like, ugh, gotta go back and do a new query, right? So all that stuff is gonna waste your time. Irrelevant results, they waste the user's time and eventually lead to search engine abandonment. Eventually people say, this search engine isn't working that great. I got to try a different one. I know there's a bunch of them out there because it's 1997 and I heard on the news about this new one called Google. Maybe I'll try that out. Okay. Now, interesting problem. Correct relevance assessment requires a lot more data than just term matches, right? So think of a simple case, right? We showed the other day that lots and lots and lots of pages will match a basic term check, right? You type in something simple like sports or news or Chicago Cubs, whatever, you're going to get untold millions of matches. So what do you do with that? Nobody's going to search through that many pages. I mean, the right stuff has got to be in there somewhere, but A, nobody's going to search through that many pages. And how do you distinguish whether one page is better than another for a particular query, right? So let's briefly discuss what other data would be helpful. Suppose data could have access to any sort of non-intrusive data, right? They have access to all the data that comes through Google. What might they want to look at? What do you think Google would like to do? They'd like to find some way to meaningful, dis meaningfully distinguish which pages are a better match than others based on something besides just text matches. So what might those other factors be? It's hard to understand when everybody's shouting out like that at the same time. Yeah, what sort of Google would, what sort of data would Google like in order to deliver better search results, more relevant search results, something besides just simple text matches. Yeah. Okay, like what? Okay, so Google could potentially look at people's search history, right? So for example, one of the things that Google might do, suppose I'm trying to figure out 
what this, uh, I don't know, new SS was, uh, oh yeah. So I was looking at some 5,200 uh, megahertz RAM, right? Cause the new generation of DDR. And I was trying to find out some stuff about that cause I'm in the market for a new machine. And if I've already done one search on that and I start searching other relevant things, Google's gonna include that fact that they say, oh, we know you're searching for 5,200 megahertz RAM they're going to preferentially include pages and topics that already have that in there. All right. So that that's one example. What other user data might be useful for Google? Anything? Yeah. Uh, location. Sure. Location, right? If I'm doing a Google search for movie show times, I ought to get different results if I'm in New York versus whether I'm in Chicago, right? Yeah. Okay, good. What other kind of stuff? Anything else? Now, one student this morning suggested accuracy, but I'm going to point out that that's a really hard thing to pinpoint for Google, right? So uh, she tossed out the possibility that maybe sites ending in an EDU are more reliable because, you know, education than other sites. And I, I said, well, you know, I, I'd like for that to be true, but I don't know. We live in uncertain times. But, you know, I mean, sure, if you could somehow assess that, the accuracy of the information, that would be great. But I, I think that's a little bit outside of Google's capabilities. Um, anything else? What do you think? Interesting. Anything else? Should pass notes. Pass notes. All right. Nothing? All right, well, let's talk. We'll, we'll get into some stuff. Okay. <clears throat> so prior to the World Wide Web, and if you if you think about this, basically think prior to 1994. So the inter World Wide Web is basically the internet you know, right? Pages with human interest content, not just files for researchers. So, and I, I know 1994 for you might as well be 1894, but still that, that's what it was. So 30 years ago, internet search was a lot like searching for a particular file on a computer because number one, most of the data that was out there was available as files and you know, search tools help you find a file, that was easy. Now, the way it could work back in the day is basically the same as if you're searching for a file in Windows or something. So you look for the file name, try to find that. Look for the file type, right? If you know it's an access file or an Excel file or some other kind of file. And you might also look at the metadata of the file, like who the author is or who the head, head person of the project is or when the file was created, stuff like that. But of course, the World Wide Web, as we know, came to dominate usage, right? The internet now is nothing like it was 30 years ago. So search needed to match terms to not only text, but also page content, right? Google, in some sense, had to figure out what a page was about. And this is, this is a big problem. This took a lot of smart guys a long time to figure out a reasonably good way to do this. So you have some basic problems, though. Number one, what's the weight you should give for all the different terms suppose somebody enters in a query that has like four or six words should they all be equally important in the matching should the first one be a lot more important than the second one but only a little more important than the third how is that going to work how should combinations of the terms be broken up right should the first two be a pair and then the second two be a pair right there's not really one single answer for how to do that. It, it's not, you know, intuitively obvious how it needs to be. Number two, simple matching mo models, right? Like just saying, does this page contain this text? Number one, a lot of pages are going to contain the same text. But number two, those models are easily broken. That means the bad guys can write pages that don't have any meaningful, useful, interesting, relevant content. They can have those pages show up high in the search results just by packing them with a lot of popular search terms. So this is a problem. This is a very big problem. Now, <clears throat> rise and decline of most search engines. So 
back during the great search engine war of the 90s, there were a lot of different firms, a lot of different search models that were trying to basically win the internet. But in the end, because economies of scale, most search engines couldn't survive. The reason is, <clears throat> this is a big problem, right? These two problems here, they are a very, very, very big problem, trying to somehow meaningfully assess what page content is. It's not an easy thing. Problem is, it requires a lot of hardware, requires a lot of time to try out different approaches, requires a lot of smart people testing algorithms, and requires a lot of data to try any of this in place. Designing a platform that assesses content relevance well is not a cheap thing to do. We're talking billions of dollars over years to make that work. But the thing is, once you've developed that platform, once you have that in place, that system with the hardware and the algorithms and people who know how it works and can maintain it, expanding it is fairly cheap. I mean, you got to add on a few new pieces of hardware and your electrical bill is going to go up, but you don't have to redesign the platform from scratch. And once you have that platform in place that can meaningfully distinguish that, yeah, I know page A and B both have those matching terms, but based on what I know, page A is a lot better match. Once you have that platform built, you can scale it relatively easily and make lots of money on ads. Now, if you're interested in this stuff, I have a couple of links here, articles about early search engines or some reasons why Google won the search engine war. You know, just interesting reading. Uh, but the short version, Google prospered because of two things. Number one, very simple ad-free interface, right? Even in the late 90s, a lot of search engines were cluttering their results with ads. And even worse, they were including uh, paid links to get bumped higher in the search listings, meaning that the search results weren't as good as they could have been. Number two, Google was able to incorporate learning into their search model. If you want to think about it this way, it's a lot like Amazon's recommender system. Essentially, <clears throat> if Google identifies that two sets of search terms lead to the same outcomes as far as same search results and the same users clicking on what search results, then for all practical purposes, those two searches are identical, right? If users enter in some different words, but they go to the same place, then in a way of thinking, those two searches must have the same meaning. Similarly, if users go to the same pages, right? If uh, Google can take a look at all the people who go to the same or similar pages and say, roll that backwards and say, you know what? The user went to the same pages, therefore in some sense, those queries must also be identical, right? So they can look at it that way and that's how they learn essentially that, oh, we're delivering good results, we're not delivering so good results based on who clicks on what. And in particular, things like not only, you know, how often does somebody click on something in the top five results, but how often do they click on something and spend some time on that site as opposed to clicking on it going there, taking a split second to look and say, nope, this isn't for me, and backtracking back to the search results. So if Google can figure out that, oh yeah, people are interested in this stuff that we're sending them, they know they're pretty much on the right track. All right. Now, relevance. So Google, of course, wants to give high quality search results, right? It wants to deliver users what they're asking for. So things like the best site, the most trusted site, most popular results, whatever, all those factors should in some sense be included to have those pages rank higher in the search listings. And that's going to encourage people to not only use Google, but to come back and keep on using Google and to tell their friends like, oh, I see you're still using such and such search engine. Well, that's crap. You should try Google. It's better. Now, one model for this was paid inclusion. So we're going to talk about this for a minute and paint. Dun, dun, dun. All right. So you all know how a page with Google search results looks, right? I'm going to draw it. Google search results. So what will happen is you'll have a bunch of links, right? I'm going to draw those as black boxes. And maybe there'll be some space at the sides, whatever. And then there's going to be some ads. So I'm drawing the ads in green. All right, does this looks familiar. 
This looks like a page of Google search results. This is plausible. This is good enough, right? Okay, so green is ads. And black is actual search results. And key things to mention, number one, ads are clearly labeled, right, as sponsored or ad or whatever. Uh, and number two, the search listing rank is pure, right? Website owners cannot directly pay Google for a better position. Hey, that means the ad result, the regular search results that Google gives, they are the best ones Google was able to generate. In contrast, you might see a paid inclusion model. Okay, so I'm going to draw this paid inclusion. Paid inclusion means the website owners are able to pay Google or pay you know, search engine whatever to have their search result listed higher. So if the search res if Amazon, for example, were paying Google in a paid inclusion model, Amazon would pay Google some money and then Google would bump up any search results from Amazon.com a little bit higher in the rankings. All right. So what you have instead is this sort of hybrid system where maybe some of the ads are in their correct spot and others have perhaps you know paid to get bumped up so i'm going to fill in a few of these with green and those are the ones that for example have been paid to get a better position okay so green fill pay for position Green, not green okay now paid inclusion isn't all bad right obviously you want to deliver search results that are better, that are more relevant, right? But there's not that much difference between Google's ad model and a paid inclusion model. But there, one important difference is this. The reason why paid inclusion worked or why it was popular for a while was because if you don't have the hardware or the systems or the people, whatever, to develop a good content analysis or content comparison scheme, paid inclusion at least says, you know, these websites that are willing to pay more, at least they're probably legitimate websites, right? They're not some scammers trying to desperately lure people to their pages to click on ads. They're probably actually selling something real because they're willing to pay money up front for the better position. So in a way, paid inclusion was sort of a substitute for learning. The other thing was in the late 90s, the writing was on the wall for anybody but Google trying to be a search engine. And so a lot of these operations were like, yeah, we know paid inclusion, you know, is kind of questionable. And yeah, it would be better to design some kind of mechanism for comparing site, uh, page content. But look, Google's going to win this thing. We're not beating Google. We got to find a way to bring in some money while we're figuring out what we're going to do after Google finally wins, because we're not going to be a search engine in five years. And so that was a way to actually have sort of a revenue stream. So it was defensible, I guess. Anyway. Now, Google doesn't do paid inclusion on its regular search results, right? Google search results are pure. The ranking you see is what Google actually figures are the best, most relevant uh, uh, order. But Google does use similar models in some cases. For example, Google Marketplace, where you know people can post uh, whatever notifications to try to sell stuff through there. In a sense, Google's sort of doing paid inclusion because operations that sell a lot through Google, Google's gonna send out its software agents more often to do refreshes. See, oh, do you have new items for sale? What's the price on those? Have there been price changes? And those things that are getting refreshed more often are naturally going to be positioned more at the top of the list. And Google says, yeah, it's not exactly paid inclusion. And it's, it's true, it's not exactly paid inclusion, but the net effect is the same. If the business is doing more money with Google, more business with Google, then, they're going to get preferential ranking. It's not that they're directly handing Google cash, but the way Google defends it is they say, well, you know, of course, we're always trying to deliver more relevant stuff, but operations that are doing more business with us, we have reason to check them more frequently, right? If you have somebody who's selling one thing on Google every six months, 
you're not going to try real hard to continuously check and see if they have something new. So anyway, so there's that. <clears throat> okay, just a couple more slides. Today's a bit of a short day. So Google's PageRank algorithm, all right? PageRank is an algorithm, was an early algorithm for just deciding which search results would get ranked above which others. Does anybody know why PageRank is slightly funny? Why it's a slightly funny name? Who are the founders of Google? Who's Googling it right now? Sergey Brin and Larry. Ah, funny fuckers, right? Yeah, page rank, get it? Okay. Uh, okay. So yeah, so there was that. Anyway, so one of the initial insights at Google, they're trying to deliver relevant search results, right? But they don't really have a good model at this point for figuring out what page content is more relevant than something else. So they do a temporary scheme and they say, you know what? More important sites have more links and people tend to want to go to more important sites, bigger sites, whatever, when presented with a list of options. So Google came up with a method that said, you know what, we're going to look at the prob random probability that some web browser travels to a page through a random set of links, right? They're on one page. There's a few links there. They randomly click on, click on one of them to go onward. That takes them to a new page. They randomly click on one of those links to go onward and so on. So basically, if a website has more pages, it's automatically more likely that someone will end up there, right? Because there's more ways to get there. And a lot of those sites have cross links within, you know, the, the site anyway. The other thing, sites that are better, have been around longer, more important, whatever, they have built connections with other sites that link to it. So a site that is big and popular and, you know, frequently visited is going to have a lot of links from a lot of other places bringing traffic to that site. Okay. Problem is, though, that's correlation, not causation. So correlation means these things tend to happen together. Causation would mean this one thing caused the other. So example of correlation, not causation. What are, what birds come back in the spring? Geese, I'll accept geese. And what else happens in the, in the spring? Baseball, right? So in baseball, in Chicago, two things happen in the spring. Number one, the geese come back. And number two, the Cubs start playing at Wrigley Field, right? That's correlation. Now, if it were causation, that would mean we could kidnap a bunch of geese from Florida, drive them back up here in a van, let them loose in Chicago, and then magically the Cubs would start playing baseball in January. That would be insane, right? That's not going to happen. That doesn't work. I've tried. Okay? So that's correlation. Same thing with Google. People aren't going to these sites just because they're popular, just because they have a lot of links going to them, right? There are other reasons why. So problem was this, this algorithm page rank worked pretty well in the late 90s because it reasonably well described what people did and what they were looking for in an environment where the web was dominated by a relatively small number of big websites. Downside, number one, it's pretty easy to manipulate those rankings, right? What happened is a lot of uh, questionable websites, they build a big website with a lot of pages. And then they'd say, you know, Google would look at that and say, oh, wow, that's a big website. It's got a lot of pages. That's going to rank up high on page rank, right? But those sites, they didn't have anything in the way of content. They were just junky pages packed with ads, no material content at all. Second thing, there were networks of those kind of junky pages all cross-linking to each other. So if you had a shady website and your shadier buddy had a shady website and his shadier buddy had a shadier website, you'd all say, you know what? If we all cross-link our shitty websites together, we'll be able to rank really high on Google and make lots of money through accidental clicks on ads. And they're like, yeah, let's do that. And that's what they did. So 25 years ago, this thing starts to get, you know, people figure out, hey, this is how page rank works. It's pretty easy to manipulate. We can design a crap site. We don't have to have good content. We just have to have a big site with lots of web pages and lots of links going to it. And we can rank up high. 
So uh, other thing, even if you're assuming that nobody's trying to be, you know, super shifty, even there, page rank favors over overly favors bigger, older, more established sites, right? There may very well be a pretty new website or a pretty new set of pages that would meet the user's interests a whole lot better. But you're not going to find that with the page rank model because that's not something that gets looked at. But again, this was what they were doing in the late 90s because it takes a lot of time to figure out how to do content analysis. This was everybody's first pass through the problem. Now, spam blogs or splogs, these were these kind of junky pages, right? So what they would do, they'd pack sites with popular search terms to draw lots of traffic. Somehow they would figure out what the popular terms were. They, you know, typical things like popular topics, things in the news, different types of technology, I don't know, names of planets, uh, names of famous people, whatever. They pack the site with all that sort of text in whatever order. A lot of times they do shifty tricks, like they make a black background for the site and then put all the text in black so you couldn't see it. Or they do big images, but they'd set the images to appear in front of text. So all the text would be behind it, but you wouldn't actually see it. This is how sometimes when you see listings for jumpy, junky pages in Google, there'll be sentences that they are, they're recognizable as syntactically valid sentences, but they don't make any sense. It'll be stuff like, we wheelbarrow jumped to Chicago by 12.05 p.m. on Saturday. And you're like, what? Why are they doing that? Well, because for a little while, Google was looking, not saying, okay, yeah, we can spot strings of random words without punctuation, but now we're going to be a little smarter and we're going to see is at least sort of fit the structure of a sentence. And so there was a window where they were trying that. And the last thing, they would pack their sites with lots and lots and lots and lots of ads, right? In the hope that you would accidentally click on one or in the paper impression model, they get paid just for showing you the ads. And sometimes they'll do devious things on the website, like they'll include a little uh, tool to go back to previous page. But if you try to click on that, then the page will like jump just a split inch and then you'll end up accidentally clicking on an ad you didn't mean to. They do stuff like that too. Anyway, uh, as late as 15 years ago, these were very common search result cluster, right? If you started digging past, you know, like into the second page of Google search results, you'd start seeing a lot of this stuff. Now, it's hard to find without really digging. I used to do it in class, but the, the last time I did it in one of my graduate classes, uh, I clicked on a link for some, what was obviously a junkie site, but then three seconds later, it redirected me to some porn site. And I was like, all right, that's kind of not safe for work. I mean, I, I don't think anybody got too upset, but you know, I don't really need, yeah, I don't really need somebody filing a formal complaint. So yeah, I don't do that anymore. Anyway, uh, again, it peaked about 15 years ago. Google's algorithms got a lot better at filtering out that kind of stuff. Number one, they developed smarter algorithms for content analysis, right? Basically they could look at stuff like this. They say, hey, does this site have an unrealistic number of popular search terms? Or does this site have uh, questionable features like, text that doesn't have any grammatical structure or text hidden behind images or text that's the same color as the background color or really big oversized pages to put in a lot of extra text, right? Stuff like that. And the other thing is uh, you could get user feedback. So back in the day uh, when Google was still working on all this stuff, anytime there was a search result link, you had a little option to you know, report this site. So if you thought, hey, this site is garbage for this particular query, you could click on it and notify Google and that was one of the signs there as well. All right. So a lot of the spam blogs, you know, they still had websites, knew how to make websites. They just didn't have good content. So a lot of cases, they gradually transitioned into ordinary clickbait, right? Things like 100 places to visit before you die, 12 signs your girlfriend's about to dump you, stuff like that. And, you know, the content isn't great, but I suppose there's potentially some interest or entertainment value there. But a spam blog has, you know, basically nothing that anybody would be interested in unless you really like looking at ads. All right. And this is a good break point. We'll come back next time. We'll talk about a little bit more stuff. That's all I got. We'll see you next time. It's been a hoot.